right, and we are live. Let's see if I can't get this to share. Copy the link, put this on Twitter. See, I don't know what concurrent viewers means, but we'll see what that means. Um, maybe eventually. I'm sure somebody might say something. Okay. Let's put a little description. <sighs> the Vale of Stars. Hashtag Comscape Writing Community Fantasy. Amazon Dark Fantasy Craft on the Indiegogo. YouTube. Okay, let's see, let's see. I don't want to hide the URL. Okay. Two concurrent viewers. Okay. Let's see, let's see. What exactly we got going here? Okay, we are actually live, everything's checking out. Two are watching while I'm doing this. All right, so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start because, you know, why not? Uh, people can filter in as they want to. All right, um, so let's see. So here we have the campaign, you can See that we have 34 backers with $1,767 made so far. Um, do I want to share this to Facebook? I don't know. Yeah, you know what? It doesn't hurt to spread the word to family and friends, which is pretty much what Facebook is. Twitter is, you know, kind of more of my connection to more broader groups like Comicsgate. Got that. Let's see. I'm wearing the Narbed hoodie, by the way. If you can see that. It's very, like, I can't, I cannot emphasize how comfortable it is. Well, we don't want to hyperlink the, the tweet. Okay, there we go. Where we go? We are live. Liver. Uh, we're not liver. Let's see how this goes. Okay. That's all the social media stuff I'm going to say about it. All right. So here we are um, on the campaign. And let's see how many viewers we have. Uh, we currently have zero. All right. So maybe I started with a couple and then I lost some. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into the artwork here or you know what maybe we'll, we'll actually start with the dune article that i have up here so we have bounty into comics which you know i know ethan manscriber uses a lot and i know that they at least from as far as i can see generally have pretty good opinions on things and they do a good job so i'm going to be forthright and just tell you i've never read dune um, but, you know, I first heard about it saying that the new movie was going to be comparable to The Lord of the Rings. And I was like, wow, that's a really bold claim. They said it was going to be like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars. And I got, I mean, I got pretty excited about it. It has like this desert, you know, hence Dune kind of feel to it. I was reading some of the summary before I started this video. It sounds pretty good, but um, basically we have the director is confirming that they are gender swapping one of the main characters or a very important character in the series from a white male with blonde hair blue eyes to a african-american woman who it looks maybe still has blue eyes but at either rate you know it's like is this a big deal you know and if it is a big deal why um frank herbert the dunes author describes Kinds, I'm assuming is that how you pronounce it. And the book has tall, thin, sandy, long hair, or long, sandy hair, a sparse beard. 
The eyes were that fathomless blue within blue under thick brows. That honestly kind of makes me think of like Jamie Lannister. Like that's kind of the image that I'm getting from reading that description. And that's definitely not what we're seeing here. That's definitely not... Eh, I mean, this, which is from an older uh, adaption. I don't know if this is from the TV show adaption or the movie adaption because I haven't seen it. But um, that's a big difference. I do like the costume on this, though. I will admit that. And the reason this is a big deal is because, like, I don't know, as a fantasy book author myself, part of me is like I kind of don't ever, like, ever want my books to be made into movies or TV shows. But like I know that nowadays that's really the only way that your book can like become like super popular. Like people knew about Game of Thrones, uh, Song of Ice and Fire, but it really didn't become popular until it was made into a TV show. So like I get that, but at the same time, like I've always been kind of worried like what I don't know to me like I maybe I'm just too protective but like I see it as you know I really take a lot of time and, and care into these characters and I'm gonna have some corrupt immoral weirdo actor gonna, that's gonna portray my beloved character you know like it almost matters to me if the actor that's portraying my character like what their personal life is like I don't know that's weird but I don't know because like their face would be attached to my character and that really matters to me and like, so I'd be really worried because I, I, intent, I very intentionally pick different, you know, genders, different sexes for my characters. I do not want characters race swapped. It'd be like if you, in the Sylvan Mist, if you read it, that'd be like if you race swapped Narbad to be a female orc. It just, that would have me literally rolling in my grave um, if I was dead, of course. Because it most certainly wouldn't be happening while I was alive. Part of the big reason why I did self-publishing and making my own publishing company was so that I could have the freedom to do what I want with my characters, you know? Because that's what's ultimately most important to me. I don't want this, like this right here is honestly my worst fear. I already have African-American uh, characters. I don't need, I don't need characters to be race swapped or gender swapped. And it, the problem is whenever people do this, it becomes a major selling point. And I, it makes it all about race and all about gender, and I don't think that that's the way that it should be. I think that's really kind of backwards. So, at any rate, um, it's not just that, too. It's more than just that, unfortunately. Um, if we read down here a little bit later, uh, Brewster commented on her role as Lieutenant Kynes, indicating the film would be woke. She stated, what Dennis had stated to me was that there was a lack of female characters in the cast, and he had always been a very feminist, pro-women, and wanted to write the role for a woman. Uh, Brewster added, this human being manages um, to basically keep the peace amongst many people. Women are very good at that, so why can't Kynes be a woman? Why shouldn't Kynes be a woman? Well, I'll tell you why, because that's not what the author wrote. That's not the way the author envisioned it. And in my opinion, you really need to respect the author's vision. Because, I mean, that's the thing. Like, with Game of Thrones, it makes sense to have all of the gratuitous violence and the sex because it's in the books. But if you try to do that with the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings, uh, I would be very, very upset. I think that you should respect the author's vision as loyally as you possibly can. And this, just for woke points, is kind of... I would be very upset if somebody did this to my book. Again, I already have really cool characters of various races. Um, and keep in mind that in my books, I have a lot of other races to worry about, like dwarves and orcs and elves and humans and gnomes and all of that stuff, in addition to the different kinds of elves, the different kinds of dwarves, and all of that. So I already have enough races to worry about in the first place. But it gets even worse still. So they're describing the film's narrative as a critique of capitalism, which I'm sorry, but I'm a history teacher and I'm here to tell you, is capitalism perfect? Absolutely not. But is it the best uh, that we have come up with so far? I think so. I actually have a, a 
um, political cartoon that actually, I think, embodies that very well right here. Let's, let's view it in its full glory. So capitalism, have you been, you have been charged with recklessly endangering the livelihood of the masses and he's got you know, this big old cigar and everything. What's your defense? He says, I'm relatively tame. And you know, that's to say that capitalism isn't perfect, it's not perfectly tame. That doesn't mean that everybody is gonna have the best life and it's gonna be perfect. But compared to the alternatives, it is relatively tame. It is kind of the best option that we have. And you really need not look any further in, in history to see that, to see the results of that, you know? So I don't know, to me, it just, it automatically irks me. Now, it's okay for people to critique capitalism, but don't expect me to like, like that. Because to me, I think that capitalism is really, I mean, it is the best way. I mean, I explain it to my students like, you know, when you take a test, you get the points that you earn. You know, I love that line from Game of Thrones where Uncle, Uncle Benjamin is like, here yeah, a man gets what he earns when he earns it, you know? And it's like you get, your, you get the score on the test that you earn. That's like capitalism, right? If you got an 80, you get an 80. Now, if this was socialism or communism, we want to redistribute the wealth. I would take points off of the kids that got A's and give it to the kids that failed so that nobody failed, so that everybody's doing equally terrible and getting a 70%. So then I tell them, well, why would you, you know, would you work harder? Would you study if you knew you were going to get the same grade no matter what? And they're like, well, no. Well, that, well then everybody's studying less, which means less people are going to be getting A's, which means there's less points to redistribute, which means now everybody's getting a 50%. And yeah, there will be some kids that will still get the A's and still work hard because that's just who they are. But the gen the premise is is that generally speaking, most people are going to work less, which means there's less to go around. Hence, communism, socialism sound really good on paper, AOC, but they really aren't that good in practice. You can't, you just can't encourage laziness. It is not a good idea. So when I see that this character and that this film is described to critique capitalism. I'm just like, you know, that's fine. And you know what? The movie Joker also kind of critiques capitalism, but I don't feel like it takes it too far. So, I mean, if it's at like Joker level, I think Joker would be the threshold of what I can tolerate of critiquing capitalism because it really does critique the parts of capitalism that are bad. Um, but if this movie is just a general, like it's harping on the whole you know, economic ideology, then I would probably have a really big problem with it. Um, so that's why I think Dune, this book, was written in the 20th, uh, written, in the tr written in the 20th century. It was a distant portrait of the reality of the oil and the capitalism and the exploitation or over-exploitation of Earth. Okay, so we're also getting into a lot of environmentalism here, which you can see a name drop down here. This just makes me roll my eyes. He concluded, today things are just worse. It is a coming of age story, but also a call for action for the youth. If you thought it might be better from there, think again. In, his, in the obvious puff piece from Vanity Fair, they describe Paul Atreides as Greta Thunberg. Uh, think Greta Thunberg, only she's a Jedi with a diploma from Hogwarts. Like, that doesn't attract me. To me, Greta Thunberg just comes across as a spoiled, privileged white girl who thinks that she knows something. I don't know. I mean, I'm actually not somebody, in my opinion, whether or not global warming is real is irrelevant. You should still take care of the earth as much as possible. But I think if people genuinely cared about the environment, like Greta Thunberg, then they would be, like, they'd walk the walk. Like, case in point millennials gen z or whatever they're called a lot of times we're usually the ones that are all pro earth and everything but if you really look at it our generations use more electricity and more energy than any other generation to come before us and so i love those memes where it's like 
you know, you guys harp on millennials and Gen Z for being on our phones too much, but what have we done? You've done all these things, and you've done this, this, and this. I'm like, this isn't going to age well. Because the truth is, you guys just, you know, we're not old enough. We're not in charge. I fear for the things we're going to do when our generations are in charge, to be honest with you. Because as a teacher, I'm kind of on the front lines of what our future is, and it does not look bright. Um, so he continued, I tried to bring him a bit more dimension. That's why I brought in Stellan. Stellan was something, uh, Stellan has something in the eyes. You feel that there's someone thinking, thinking, thinking. It has tension and calculating inside deep in the eyes. I can testify it can be quite frightening. I don't really know. Is, are these the eyes we're supposed to be looking at? They look like eyes to me. They're, I don't know. Again, I, I haven't read the book, but... This is not selling me on it, that's for sure. So kind of closing thoughts of the article before we get into the deep dive of the artwork. Um, I'm assuming the director does note that creating Dune is the most significant thing that he's done in his life. He explains it's a book that tackles politics, religion, ecology, spirituality, and with a lot of, uh, a lot of characters. He then concludes, I think that's why it's so difficult. Honestly, it's by far the most difficult thing I've done in my life. Dune is expected to be released in two installments, with Frank Herbert's first Dune novel being broken into two parts. The first part is supposed to come out December 18th, 2020. Although I highly doubt that's going to happen with the coronavirus stuff. Um, I mean, I really need to read the book. If the book really is what he says it is, that the book is political, and it's all of these things, and it is already environmental, I mean, if it's loyal to the author... I don't have a problem with that, um, but this obviously is not loyal to the author for obvious reasons. But if this is something that the author probably would have been okay with, then it doesn't bother me that much. Now that being said, given the political message that I see that it's aiming towards, would I go and watch it and spend money, go on a date, spend like 40 bucks? No. But I'm not going to like critique the movie. Um, as be as long as it's loyal to the author's vision, I'm not going to be like super upset about it. Um, so I'd have to read the book. It's on my list, but you know, so I'm not going to go and watch it because of what I see here. But I'm also like, I mean, if this is the author's vision, this is the author's vision. But judging by what I've heard, I don't think this would be something that the author would be happy about. So. I don't know, it seems to me like they're ruining another great franchise. Um, if the author would be okay with it, that's fine. I still wouldn't watch it based off of these, obviously, like gender politics and everything. But, that's me. That's me. Let's see, do we have anybody viewing? Still no? Still nobody? Well, we were good in the beginning. I guess maybe I have too much of a monotone voice, maybe. Let's see what updates we have on the Tweet Hour world before we get into these artwork. Of course, the great thing about live is that people can always watch it later. All right, so let's get into the artwork here, and I'll kind of talk about it a little bit. This is my file that has really all of the illustrations I've ever had for Mistwood done, minus a few. That's obviously not mine, I just really like it. Let's see, the cover here, we actually have it split into different groups. So, when you're getting something printed on like a novel book cover, you have to worry about the amount of colors that are being printed, because they usually have a four ink process. So this is the cover having been JPEG'd, or PNG'd, I should say. Um, but that's not the file that's going to go into the printer. This is the file that's going to go into the printer. The colors are a little bit more simplified so that it will print much easier. So my graphic designer is actually working on it right now. And the words are going to be up here. Um, if I find it real quick, um, it's going to be in this vein. It's going to be in this vein. Maybe if I did a terrible accent, people would be less bored with my monotone voice. 
So it's going to be in this style, and I really like my uncle's drawing ability because it is my uncle. He's a very accomplished graphic designer. Um, it'll be, it'll say Legends of Fostra, you know, uh, Saga One up here, and it will have the tower. Well, it won't say the tower, but it'll say the Veil of Stars, and I'll have my name down here. And something I really like about it is he always incorporates parts of the illustration into the wording. So, um, so I imagine that the Veil of Stars is going to interact with the axe in some way or another. I have a really hard time imagining that, that wouldn't be the case. And my name might interact with this shield or this guy's face or something like that. And on the back, uh, the description will probably, I can't imagine it not being right up here. I mean, because that's the glaringly obvious place to put it. And the barcode will probably be like right here. This part right here is gonna be the spine. And for that part, I'm going to have it like, it's going to say Saga 1 right here. And then we'll have um, SR Mori, the Veil of Stars. I think SR Mori is going to be horizontal right here. And then the Veil of Stars is going to be vertical right there with kind of a similar wording design that you see there. So it's going to look really classy. There's actually a book cover that I could look that would show us that. Um, trilogy spine art. Let's see if this comes up. Yeah, so like you see here, this these covers are very much so largely what I'm basing my cover off of. Um, so you might see my name like this and the veil of stars like that, but it might be quite a bit lower down. And then the Mistwood logo right down there, and that's gonna look really nice. But let's zoom into this. Let's let's zoom in and see things on a closer detail. And we'll do the map, and we'll do various illustrations as well. So this is an arm riller. Uh, they're really supposed to have like an orcish, I mean not orcish, um, trollish kind of body. Get as, as zoomed in as we can get. That's how big this file is with the head of a moray eel, and sometimes they have long hairs on their jawlines. I decided not to do that on this one because, you know, just a little bit less complexity. Um, he really looks perfect, to be honest with you. Nice and beefy, that big old mace. Here we have the main villain, Is, and he's actually been drawn a few times, and he's probably going to be drawn a couple more times as well. Um, you know, really zooming in here, this actually is a very good job, to be honest. Look at those eyes. The eyes are supposed to be kind of like his most defining characteristic. Very creepy. Um, but I am... There are plans to have a dark fantasy guy take a stab at it and make him look really, really ominous. And then we see a lift over here, which is kind of like my version of goblins. Uh, they're actually called surface goblins is another name you could give a lift. This is a windigo right here. You can see the tusks. You can see his ugly face. Uh, this would actually be what I would call, I mean, this is a perfect looking windigo right here. I mean, in all actuality, that's what they look like. Uh, they're supposed to be a little bit taller than a human, a little bit bigger. They have a lot of white hair all over them. They have the tusks. I really love his teeth and his eyes. He looks really sinister here. Um, and Wendigos come from Native American mythology and I changed them up a little bit. Although the mythological type of Wendigo is also in this book, but I don't want to spoil that for you. Here's a lift with a war hammer. Here's a lift. Um, this is really probably the best lift face on the entire book cover. They're really supposed to be quite ugly. Um, and gang roll looking very small. This is a smaller Wendigo. Again, you can identify them because of the tusks. I really like the sword and the hair and the texture on the armor. Uh, this guy, I really like him. Even though you only see him from the back, he just, it really gives a good perspective. You know, it adds a lot of dimension to it. We see the dead bodies on the snow. The blood was very important to me because my books are so violent. 
and there's a strong emphasis on violence. Here we see this guy. This is a good lift face as well. Lifts can also have kind of piggish looking faces, and I think that this is a really good lift face as well. This is a really good lift face. Actually, I'll have a lot of work done on this guy because it took a long time for him to look like a lift. He looked very different for a long time. This is also a lift, um, pretty well done. I'll get to her in a minute. Here we have a Wendigo. He's a little goony looking, but I still like him a lot. I actually requested this. This actually used to be a lift. I requested it to be a Wendigo. Then we have our Wendigo who's being, it looks like he's been decapitated and he's about to be kicked, Spartan kicked off the ledge. You can see his little hook weapon. And um, I'm going to get to the heroes last. This guy also required a lot of a lot of work on, but I think that he ended in a really good place too. Or like his spear. This guy getting his head decapitated. I actually requested for it to be decapitated. We're getting really close, so that's why you can see all the art marks. Like we're like really, really zoomed in. And we can actually zoom in quite a bit more. It's just why would you want to? Because you really can't see what's going on at all. I really actually like this guy in the corner quite a bit. He's ugly. Then we have this guy. He used to be bald, but I like that he added the hair on it. I think it looks much better that way. So I'm look at the heroes. We have Talia and Ruth, who are siblings. Now, Talia is... Uh, she's a really, really good character. I think that she's going to be largely the connection to the audience. Um, she's very insecure about herself. She's not a very good fighter in the beginning, and she doesn't really know what her place is. And I think that she just has a really, really, really relatable personality. Like, she just has one of those personalities that would be really difficult not to like. Um, she has a very nurturing soul. She's a very pure heart, a um, very good, nice person. Um, and I really have to just say, like, hats off to the artists for, for doing that. I always have specific faces in mind for my characters. And this is pretty much spot on with what the character is supposed to look like. Now, her hair is supposed to be like very, very curly, um, but on a cover with this much detail, when it's zoomed out, you really can't tell uh, too much, and it's in the middle of the battle, and I didn't want to make it too complicated, and it already looks so good. Um, for you guys know, like this artwork here, Narva's strong heart, uh, which is our main character. For each book, I'm going to have something like this done, and for the next book, it's going to be her and a character named Zipes Longroot, who is a gnome. And so I wasn't really too worried about getting her hair. When, I wasn't going to be nitpicky like that on the artist because I didn't want to be a pain in the butt because I was already trying to get him to get her waist to be more realistically thin and not be, like, obese. Um, so I, I'll probably bug him a lot more about the curly hair on on the solo piece, which I imagine will probably get done within a year or so, maybe two years. Very nice on the legs. Originally in the book, I had it to where this was not there, but you know, it looks good. So I just had him keep it. I thought that it looked really good. And this was also originally red, but I, you know, I liked the color. I liked the blue color, and so I decided to keep it. We zoom out. I think that if you zoom in too much, they start to look kind of bad. But she really looks good um, pretty much no matter how zoomed in you are. This sword is actually really cool, and I really like that he took the time to put this detail on it because the sword is made by the Dwarf King of the Twin Mountains, and it is gifted to her. Uh, after Narbad saves the Dwarf King's son. And uh, it, if you say the right word, it's almost like Guinevar in The Legend of Dritzt, where it'll summon, instead of a panther, it summons a massive lion named Holler. Uh, and it's, it's just really cool. These are actually lions biting on the blade. 
it would be ridiculous to ask him to put that much detail whenever, you know, on the book cover it's going to be like this. I mean, they're going to be smaller than this on the actual book cover. You would never see that kind of detail um, from that, from the size of a book. Here we have Narbad, another clip, you know, again, here he is. On here, again, very comfortable hoodie. It's available in the Neris's Horde package. Um, he's supposed to resemble Sean Bean. Um, I honestly, whenever I write the character, I always read his, when he talks, I always read in Sean Bean's voice. Just because I really like Sean Bean. He's one of my absolute favorite actors. Excuse me. These axes are very special and very unique, um, but I don't want to spoil anything about them, but they're really cool, like awesome. And well, let's zoom in a little bit more on him. I really like his outfit. His outfit is actually the same metal as Talia's sword. It's called Aeromethyl, which is basically my version of Mithril. You know, every fantasy book needs their version of Mithril. It's supposed to be kind of like shiny, like starlight. Um, but the, his suit is intentionally dimmed a little bit because you don't want to stick out like a sore thumb in the middle of combat. And he does have a matching helmet, but obviously on a book cover, you want your hero's face all dramatic with the hair blowing in the wind and all that. So I really, really love that he's doing the Spartan kick. I cannot tell you how much I love that. It's like he... And now he's like, bam! Just kicking him down, you know? Kicking him down. And then we have Ruth, who is technically the captain of the companions. I was a little worried he'd look too much like Link, but I don't think that he does. Because he's really nothing like Link, and that's not even remotely what the inspiration is. So he has a shirt of bronze gold scales, slash chainmail, which is what you're seeing there. And you can see his golden sword and shield. And um, he's kind of a jerk, but you also love him. You love him and you hate him at the same time, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's the book cover. It's going to look really good I'm, whenever the lettering is all on it. I really am confident it's going to look really beautiful. The type of cover laminate, it's not even laminate, it's it, Aqueous coating is going to be really smooth and fancy and it's not going to peel at all and it's going to look really good It's going to be so beautiful now That's the cover But let's look at the other artwork so Near the front of the book there is going to be this monkey Because at a point in the book Narbad runs into these monkeys and it's a very pivotal moment in the story. You see how much we can zoom in here? Look at that. It's ridiculous. Um, but I just think they're adorable, and I really wanted... I don't know, I want the... Be, I, first of all, I always love it when books have interior art in them. Uh, of course, they have to be pencil because it's a novel book, but I just really, really like the detail and how cute he is. He's supposed to be very cute. He kind of leads Narbad to this very pivotal moment in the book, and he kind of stumbles upon it by accident. And the way I describe the monkey in the book is very specific, and I feel that the artist, Nate Heiler, just captured it very well. He's supposed to be on this little boulder, and he's kind of just like watching Narbad, and then he like jumps off, and he basically motions for Narbad to follow him. And then uh, leads into this really important part of the book. Um, the monkey is modeled after a baby, the monkeys that go in the spas in Japan. He's kind of modeled after that. Yeah. I don't really think there's any point in going any zooming any more onto that. But this is the like these are the actual files. Like whenever I post something on Twitter, you obviously it. It doesn't put the full resolution on there, um, so we're doing things that you can't actually do on my right post up. So this one's actually really detailed. This is Is as well. This is a, another um, drawing of Is done by the same guy that did the monkey. 
and I really like it. It's a it's a different take on the character, but look at that. I mean, we can get really zoomed in here if we want to. You know, look at the detail work, and he hand draws his art, so that's that makes it really cool too. And I really like it because he is like the god of the demon god of like snow and winter. So I really like the black dots all over it. It gives it a real sense of like snow, even when you're dealing in black and white. His sword is made of ice, um, magical ice, of course, because ice as a weapon is ridiculous. But um, yeah, he just looks really, really cool. Let's get a good close-up zoom of him. So the crown should be like a really like midnight, like almost navy blue, ice-ish looking crown. His face is kind of lich, lich, kind of like Witch King, Lord of the Rings, or White Walker-ish. Uh, I like that there's ice coming off of the cape or the shoulder armor, and there's ice coming off of his breastplate. And his cape is also supposed to be very wispy and everything, so that's also really well done. And his hands, I really like the arm armor as well. His hands are supposed to be really long and crack and creak like breaking ice. Ooh, I love that cross guard. I love the forearm here and the hand. He's just got those long fingers that crack and crinkle like ice. And so that will go in the book as well. So the monkey will be inside of the book. This will be inside of the book. It's like a novel, okay? But there's going to be these epic pieces of artwork in it. And then one last thing that's going to be in this book inside of it and that is the map that I drew let's zoom in here you can zoom in a lot I had it professionally scanned I was really concerned that it wasn't going to be possible because of the quarantine stuff going on now if you know me at all you know that I don't really have a lot of artistic talent. And so, well, last time I had the book map, I had it uh, vectorized, and that was a horrible experience. They misspelled mountains, and like you had, I had to go in and correct all these spellings, and like, it was just a hey, eventually I was like, oh, I give up. And it didn't even look that good either. Like, I'm not an amazing artist, but you get like really zoomed in on this and you can see a lot of the mistakes and everything. Well, like the where I'm not a great artist, not that there are mistakes, but um, you're looking at a, at a zoomed out stage and you can definitely see that there is, that it looks good. And I know that it looks a little blurry here, but I have tested it out and it will print in the books legibly where you can actually be able to read like this. Um, so that's not going to be a problem. Um, so the book predominantly, the elves start here in Grindel, which is the capital of the elven world. The immortal forest is predominantly where the elves live. We have Mog Durig, which is where several of the characters are for. It's kind of like the university for elves in combat and or clerical school. We have Narnanath and Berylin and Eskela, which are high elf um, wood Elf Cities. Uh, Ainan is a Grey Elf civilization that is well known, um, but it'll become a big deal later on in the series. And Neldorath is where the Half Elves are. And the reason why there's only one Elf and Half is because way long ago, this really big war, and the Elves practiced Scorched Earth policy on this half of the forest. And so these trees are a lot younger, and so they kind of gave them to the half-elves. It's kind of like, well, we don't want it anyway. Um, we have the Westmark. Uh, there's a lot of elves here, too. If you read the Silver Mist, that's where the Fingolfins come from. They're kind of like high elves that were not okay with the racial hierarchy of um, Berylin and the Immortal Forest. So they kind of created their own kingdom. Mount Gesu and the Great Ravine in the fields of Ragnarok are kind of physical land features that were made during the events of Ragnarok, which is kind of like the ending of the first, kind of like the ending of BC in my world. 
The ending of like BC is with this event called Ragnarok, which is explained in the first chapter of the book. And everything after that is, you know, essentially after Ragnarok, which is, you know, obviously a reference to Norse mythology. We have the Mistwood, which is totally where I get the Mistwood publishing from. You are correct. Norden, which is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a um, Numenorean slash Winterfellish place. Anyway, the elves venture north because an armed guard, I don't want to get into all the details, it's very complicated and I don't want to spoil anything, but basically the elves have to go on a mission up to Hollingstead, and while on the way there they have to stop in Ekitop, which is where Narbad the orc character is, and he is a slave. In my books, I wanted to I wanted to make it different. Every author wants to have something that sep that sets them apart, that makes them unique. And so in my books, orcs are not actually a part of the original races that were made by the Odin slash god figure. And they were actually made several millennia later as a way of defending against the equivalent of Loki or Satan. And so the orcs are made to be knights, to be warriors, to be noble and loyal to God. They're uglier, their skin is green, and they have the orcish teeth and everything because they're literally made to be fighters. But in their hearts, they're very noble. But their physical appearance and other reasons of jealousy has kind of led the other races of Fostra to be very much so prejudiced against them. So the orcs uh, tend to be slaves because all the other races other than the dwarves have pretty much ganged up on them and mainly dwarves are too busy worrying with their own stuff to really pay too much attention to it anyway. So they're not going to really stop the other races. Anyway, they pick up Narbad and then they sail uh, to Stafel, which is where the dwarves are predominantly. These are the Twin Mountains, Orman and Golorder, uh are the three main dwarven kingdoms, although they're not the only ones. And so the first third of the book is them getting to Ekitop and Narbed dealing with dramas happening there. The second part of the book is them traversing this very wintry, cold... Uh, they're trying to get here, but they couldn't go through the Grand Pass because they knew it would be very heavily defended and dangerous. And there's a lot of dangers in this pass as well. So they wanted to make it the safest route, which is crossing from right here over there to make it safe. Um, so they have to go around this way. So they walk, they get to the Twin Mountains. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens up here. And then they get down into the dark forest where they meet this character named Neris, who you guys will certainly enjoy meeting. I do plan on having art made for her that is exclusive for comic skaters that back my project. So if you are a comic skater, you will get a bookmark of that character for free. And if you spend more than $50, you will get a poster and a bookmark of that character. And trust me, you will like that character. I know my customers in Comicsgate very well, and I'm very confident that you will like the result of that. Um, it's not done yet, but it will be soon, hopefully. Uh, so the third part of the book is the Dark Forest and dealing with the villain. Um, but that's the geography part that is... Oh, wow, that looks cool. That's the geography that we're dealing with here. There are also a lot of people from this, which are kind of like the Vikings coming into this country that's called Nakvior, uh, which is kind of like the Anglo-Saxons. Talor, is, they don't really go there, but it is mentioned a lot. It's kind of like the Greek slash Roman Empire slash America. Deep woods where you'd find a lot of gnomes. Orm is a giant swamp. You don't want to go in there. The Crone Mountains, um, you'll see some, that's kind of where I put like Asian-ish civilizations uh, in these locations, but we'll get there. Not in this book, but later. And then over here, there is a very large island called Hanor, um, which Saga 3 and 2 are going to have a very large amount of time spent there, so you want to get to know that area. And then when we get to that book, there will of course be a map of that in there. 
Now, if you did read the Silva Mist, you probably recognize that there are some pretty significant geographical changes in certain areas, specifically over here. That is because there is a lot that happens in between Saga 1, which is this book, and Saga 5, which was the Silva Mist. For those of you that don't know, the Silva Mist was my first book that I wrote. It's kind of like the middle book. You don't have to have read it, not even a little bit. To understand this book, I kind of pulled a C.S. Lewis where I did half... Well, I started in the middle, and then I'm going to the beginning. Um, partially because I was intimidated by these bigger storylines. I wanted to get one book in before I tackled the really big storylines. But now I've done that. So now I am perfectly fine writing the big storylines, and we're all good to go. There's a lot of fun things that happen right here. A lot of really... I'd say actually my favorite part of the entire book is in part three, and I also really like, I mean, I like the whole book, but part one and part three, I think, are my absolute favorite parts. Now, other artworks uh, that you can get on the campaign. Let's see, how long have we been going? We still have nobody watching. We've been going for an hour and a half, though. Well, we're just going to keep going. It is what it is. I mean, that's totally what I thought was going to happen. Everyone's like, you gotta build your channel. You can't end your live stream too soon because people will join. I'm like, well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I don't know. It's a little disheartening, I won't lie to you. But maybe somebody will watch it later on. Oh yeah, this is also gonna be in the book. This is Narbad's war sigil that he'll get later on in the series, but it still kind of symbolizes Narbad. Um, which is actually on the back of this hood, right here. So when you have your hood up, people can see it. But at the beginning of each chapter, that will be there. And if I can get it, anytime there's like a change in scenery, sometimes they'll have like a dot, dot, dot. I would love to have three of these, you know, like dot, 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 but the dots are this sigil. I think that would be really cool. So other artwork you can get with the campaign, you can get um, the Narbad sticker, which is of this art. You can get a lot of this stuff. I'm actually just going to go through probably all of it. So we can get really close in on this. This is one of my favorite pieces I've ever had done, to be honest with you. This is exactly how I envision the hero when he is young. When he's older, his hair is a little bit different, but um, I mean, this is just perfect. Absolutely beautiful, absolutely stunning. And when you have it on your phone, it's a black background. It makes a really nice wallpaper, which is one of the uh, stretch goals if we get there, is I'd give that to everybody. But I absolutely love the detail. This is the file that had to be changed for the hoodies. It's kind of a simple layout. Um, this is an artwork of a gray elf. You can get this as a print um, and the Tima's package. Can pick your prince. Her name is Aeswin, and she's a character that's in Saga 6, 7, 8, 9, and she's largely inspired off of my wife. Um, but we haven't we haven't really been introduced to her as a character yet. I mean, you are in the Sylvan Mist, but very vaguely. Um, but she's going to be very prominent in the books to come. And I have her illustrated several times because she's honestly my like second favorite character. And I have a very, very unique um, and strong opinion of what she should look like. So this is perfect, though, by the Duran. Um, I don't want to really talk about that because I'll spoil things. This is the Duran's attempt on Is. It's pretty good. It's pretty loyal. This is actually pretty much exactly what he looks like. Uh, the only thing that I would change is I'm not a huge fan of this anymore. I mean, I liked it at first, but I've kind of changed my mind since then. But I really like his arm. I really like the shoulder armor and the crown and the face. My only real gripe is that it kind of looks like this is his hair still, and it's not. So if I were ever to go back, I'd have, it, have him change it to where it's obviously that this is the cloak, and I would have the cloak cover a lot more territory because I mean it's supposed to be like crazy the cloak is supposed to cover a lot of ground 
And it's supposed to be very big and almost look like a winter storm. This is another version of him where the eyes are a little bit thinner, which is actually the version that I go with. Mm, I already saw that. That's Zach with longer hair. Some rough drafts of where he was going to go. I'm going to go the other way. I thought it would let me go from the beginning, but I guess it's not going to do that. Monkey, monkey, this work by Vic King. This is just a picture. I'll I'll do a um a scan of it as soon as it comes in the mail. This is Ruth. These are the three people that are on the cover. This is his version, of it, and I think that he does an excellent job. Beautiful, love Narbad. I just I really love the character, and I really love seeing him drawn in all the different styles. This is a book cover for a book that I have not published yet, but I was going to, but now I'm holding off on publishing it. Um, that is a character named Zack Bonebreaker and a character named Soleil Winter. You won't meet her until Saga 4, but you will meet Zack in Saga 1. Map. Here is Zack Bonebreaker. Uh, he's honestly my third favorite character. My favorite character being Elyon from The Sylvan Mist. He is, he is the most fun character to write. He earns the name Bonebreaker. I really, really love the shining on the armor and the texture of the armor here. It's very beautiful. I love the helmet. I don't even care. Antlers are impractical, but I don't care because it's Zack Bonebreaker, and he just looks freaking perfect. Which, by the way, I'm getting a sigil made for him as well, and it is the helmet. That's his sigil. And it's going to be, you know, his colors are, every character has colors. You know, Narbad's is dark forest green with a black sigil. Zach's is um, the helmet in like a navy blue on a red um, banner. Very beautiful. It's one of my favorite pieces still. That is a rough draft. That is a rough draft, rough draft, rough draft, rough draft, rough draft, rough draft. Cover, different versions of the cover. Um, this is Aeswin later on in the book series. So it's that same gray elf character that I said was inspired off of my wife. A lot of people really like this piece. I really like that the the lips are dark gray. Um, it's very important to me. Gray elves are not dark elves. It kind of bothers me, but people always are like, "Wow, that's a really nice dark elf." Like, dark elves in D and D or drow's drow elves, they have ebony skin. Like their skin is like black, black, like black. Um, whereas these are gray elves. Like their skin is light gray to dark gray. Their hair is very is stark white like a dark elf, but um, they're kind of similar, but they're also not, you know. I really love the detail, the dagger. Um, so yeah, she's definitely one of my all-time favorite characters. Can't wait for you guys to meet her. She's kind of like an epic assassin character. This was my Russian attempting to draw her, but it really more looks like another character. So I've kind of repurposed it to be Tima from the Saga 1 books. So Saga 1 book, which is the one that's on, live on Indiegogo right now. I really love his attention to detail. And when you zoom in, the background looks very undetailed, but when you zoom out, it's it looks very good, you know? Like, that's really nice. I really like the orange color in there. Um, that's just a standard gray elf. It's not really canon. This is my attempt at drawing A.S. Wynn. I have no artistic talent. And that is all of it, except for the Silver Mist cover, but that is easily seen in other locations. So that's really all of the artwork. 
Um, I hope I didn't bore you. I know that my voice is is not the most thrilling in the world, and I know that um, well, I can't get too loud because I have a sleeping son who is a four month old upstairs, so I don't want to go too extreme with my volume and energy. So I apologize for that. Um, I guess we've actually only been going for like 54 minutes. For some reason it felt longer than that. But at any rate, um, thank you to those that the one or I guess the most we got was three. Makes me feel good. <laughs> um, but you know, you gotta start somewhere, I guess. You gotta start somewhere. I don't think I end up getting much attention on Twitter. Yeah, I'm getting texts from my wife saying I'm too loud and that I should shut up. Anyway. Have a wonderful night. I hope that you enjoyed this. I I like talking about my books, and the Dune thing was really more to like garner some attention. I was going to talk about... Um, yeah, my wife said, you're getting too excited. I'm like, I don't think my audience will think so, but... Uh, I was going to talk more about like certain books and fantasy movies that I like, but I mean, I would probably do that if we had, uh, well, we actually have a viewer right now. So, I mean, that's good. Um, but I don't know. I might end it. I might end it. We'll see. I feel like, uh, 53 minutes is, 56 minutes is a good amount of time. I'll probably talk about other fantasy movies and things that I really enjoy at a later date. Um, have a lovely night. Have a good weekend. I'm going to try to do a live stream every week. Build up an audience that way. I do make videos. I mean, I do upload videos from time to time. It's just I'm teaching online right now, so it's... It is a lot of work to make video notes videos for you know all of my classes and then make videos for this as well especially whenever the view count is so small and it doesn't really ever seem to increase. I think the real key is I need to become I need to get on other people's live streams. I think that that I think that would be really key. Let's see. I don't think that we got any new backers. Not gonna lie to you guys, that's pretty good. I mean, we're almost halfway there, like halfway. We start with 50 days. We're almost halfway, um, and we're sitting at 58%. We got to that 50% pretty quickly, and since then we've gone pretty slowly. So I'm really hoping that we pick up. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna get really concerned um, but, you know, if we get to the 2,000 mark by the end of Sunday, I'll make another cheese-eating video. If you don't know what that is, look on the channel. You'll find it. Cheese, I don't like cheese. It makes me throw up. Um, yeah, we have a chapter sample on here if you want to see what you know how good I am at writing. If you don't want to take my word for it. Maybe next week I'll do a live stream where I read it in my probably earlier in the day when my son's not sleeping um, and I can maybe try to do voices and stuff I know it might not sound like it but I'm actually pretty good with impressions if I'm really trying so there's that there's some descriptions and things there's a personality quiz where you can find out which of my characters you are you can take a little personality test please share the results because I, I really like seeing the results That's the one I wanted to see. It's a really fun quiz, actually. I really do love seeing people's results. There's the map. Um, the map. If in case this isn't enough, we have a description of each of the packages right here. Add-on items. Uh, going to specifics of the prints that you can get with the Tima's Blade package. I am thinking of doing a promotional where, like, 
if you back during a certain week, you'll get a free print of something. I'm really starting to get desperate. Stretch goals. There's that Zach art. Love that. Now something that I will announce here and now and only you guys will know about is I am actually working on a visual companion to go with the book. So it will be, I'm either going to make it an add-on item or, you know, if we get to the 3,000 goal, I might just, of course then, I don't know, I haven't decided yet, but point is I'm working on it um, and that's actually what this app is for. I'm going to make a little booklet and it's going to have art of each of the main each of the main characters and villains and little bit bios of them. It's a visual companion. Um, I mentioned earlier that there was an artist that was going to work on uh, kind of a dark fantasy take on this and that's going to be hopefully the cover for that and um, I think that I think that will draw in a lot of people. It's going to look very nice. I'm going to include all of the art that you've seen today. I'm going to put as much art as I possibly can in there. I found a comic skate artist. Um, let me see if I can remember his name. Uh, I'd be quickest. I got Avery Butterworth, illustration 762. He's comic skate. He is doing those character designs. Now for Narbad, Talia, and Ruth, and characters like Is, who I already have done, he's not doing those because I do have to. I have do have to keep in mind um, budget and all that. It's pretty inexpensive though, to be honest. I think it will really pay off. I think it will really pay off. But anyway, you know, spread the word, get the word out, you know. Says, you know, even if you can't afford it, you know, you can get the word out. It helps every little bit. Every little bit helps. I really, really want to meet this goal. I really want to... I really want to get this book out to you guys, you know. And, you know, we spent the last hour going through the art and going into detail on the art. And I've officially announced that there's going to be a visual companion. And I would really love to give that to each physical backer for free. Um... That might be what I do, I just have to look at what it costs um, to see that it's financially viable. It might just be for certain tiers or an add-on item, you know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But anyway, have a good night. Have a good weekend. Um, take care of yourselves. Love you guys. Love Comicsgate. Love, you know, everything that uh, we stand for. Love you guys. Um, peace out. Uh, we'll try to do this next week. Have a good weekend. Peace out.